Welcome back everybody, it's your favorite pal Nathro back on the scene. And this time, I've got some simple history, the assassination of John F. Kennedy in 1963. So, John F. Kennedy, he was an important president, he was the one that was in office during the whole Cuban Missile Crisis. And yeah, unfortunately his term ended in tragedy, and I'm going to see what simple history is going to say about it. I don't know if I've seen any videos from this channel, so should be interesting. Let's get started. Assassination of John F. Kennedy. Friday, November 22nd, 1963. John F. Kennedy served as president during the height of the Cold War. During his presidency, he saw the increase of military spending on both nuclear and conventional forces and increased the number of U.S. advisors in Vietnam from 400 to 16,000. The Bay of Pigs fiasco, the failure of 1,400 Cuban exiles trained by the CIA to invade their own country, began at the start of his presidency. Then there was the Cuban Missile Crisis, resulting in the USSR and the USA signing the Test Ban Treaty, forbidding nuclear testing in the atmosphere. It also established the hotline, a direct telephone contact between the White House and the Kremlin. During Kennedy's time in office, the Berlin Wall was built by the Soviets in order to stop refugees from fleeing from East Germany to West Germany. In Berlin, he delivered a speech challenging Soviet oppression and gave hope to the people of the city. But in the winter of 1963, the presidency of John F. Kennedy would be tragically cut short. On November 21, 1963, President John F. Kennedy and his wife Jacqueline departed on Air Force One for a two-day, five-city tour of Texas. Mm. He was to announce his candidacy for the 1964 presidential elections there because Texas was vital for his re-election. Texans needed to be convinced as the state was largely not in favor of Kennedy's civil rights policies and handling of foreign policies like the Bay of Pigs fiasco. The feuding among Democrats... Yeah. Very true. Um, Texas has always historically been a conservative state. However, there's been a large influx of people moving into the state um, from other democratic states. And some people say that within time that Texas may v very well become a swing state. Whether that actually happens, I don't know. I guess only time will tell. Democratic Party leaders there also hindered his chances of re-election, and they needed to be brought together. The next morning on November 22nd, Kennedy made a speech to a large crowd outside the hotel that he had stayed in at Fort Worth, and then made another speech inside, at a breakfast hosted by the local Chamber of Commerce. He would say in the last speech he would ever make, This is a very dangerous and uncertain world. We would like to live as we once lived, but history will not permit it. The presidential party left the Texas hotel and went by motorcade to Carswell Air Force Base, boarding Air Force One, and landing at Dallas's Love Field Airport a short time later. President Kennedy and his wife shook hands with an enthusiastic crowd and sat in the back seats of their limousine as part of the motorcade. Democratic Texas Governor John Connolly and his wife were seated in the seats in front of them. In front of these seats were two Secret Service agents. The president's next stop was the Dallas Trade Mart, approximately 10 miles away, where Kennedy was scheduled to deliver another speech. It's estimated that about 200,000 people lined the route to the Trade Mart. The limousine the president was traveling in was an open-top 1961 Lincoln Continental four-door convertible limousine that was called the SS-100X by the Secret Service. The motorcade moved through Dealey Plaza in downtown Dallas. Nellie Connolly, the First Lady of Texas, turned around to the President who was sitting behind her and commented, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. Which President Kennedy acknowledged by saying, No, you certainly can't. Those were the last words ever spoken by John F. Kennedy. At 12.30 p.m., the motorcade was passing the grassy knoll to the north of Elm Street and moving towards the Texas School Book Depository. Then gunshots were heard. A bullet hit President Kennedy's neck and hit Governor Connolly's shoulder and wrist. A second shot then hit President Kennedy in the head, covering the limousine's rear interior with fragments of skull, blood, and brain. So, yeah, at first the assassination was shrouded in a lot of mystery. 
A lot of people were very confused as to how the trajectory of the bullet traveled, and some were calling it the magic bullet for a while because of um, how it pierced, you know, John F. Kennedy and the other uh, other guy that was in front of him. But over time, there have been so many different analyses done by different people, and it's been concluded almost indefinitely that the people that were sitting in the car were positioned at different heights due to the seats that they were sitting in so it's kind of cleared up some mystery however there's still a bunch of conspiracies going on about it you know people say that you know he wasn't even shot from the window like the window from where lee harvey oswald was was stationed and i've even heard some conspiracy theorists say that the driver is the one that shot him i don't <laughs> yeah there's there's all kinds of stuff going around about it but yeah anyway let's continue the impact was so severe that blood and fragments even landed on the secret service car that was following behind the limousine sped off to parkland memorial hospital within minutes but it was already too late and doctors efforts were in vain kennedy was declared dead at 1 p.m Connolly would recover from his wounds. The country and the world was in shock. President Kennedy's body was taken from Parkland Hospital to Love Field and loaded onto Air Force One. At 2.38 p.m., sheltered on board Air Force One in case of further assassination attempts, Lyndon B. Johnson took the oath of office with Jacqueline Kennedy by his side, still wearing her blood-spattered clothes. The oath was administered by U.S. District Court Judge Sarah Hughes. Less than an hour earlier, a person had been arrested by the police. Witnesses had reported hearing and seeing shots from different directions, but several accounts mentioned the southeast corner window on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository Building. Only two employees from the building were missing, one who had walked outside and wasn't allowed back into the building by police at the time of the shooting, and another, Lee Harvey Oswald, who had only been working there for a month. He had been seen and described by the witnesses who saw him in the sixth floor window, so a description was sent out by the police. As he moved down the floors, he was encountered by Dallas police officer Marion L. Baker, who had his gun drawn. He was allowed to pass, however, because Oswald's supervisor identified him as an employee. Mm, yeah, Oswald sense. had slipped out of the book depository after the shooting, had walked several blocks, caught a city bus, and then hailed a taxi, and took him straight to his boarding house. There, he picked up a pistol and a coat and began to walk aimlessly. Oswald had already left the scene on a bus to his boarding house by 12.40 p.m., but the police did discover a rifle underneath some boxes and its shells by the window on the sixth floor, as witnesses had described. The police identified it as a 7.65 Mauser, but later the FBI announced that the police were mistaken and the rifle was an Italian Carcano M91-38 oh, bolt-action okay. rifle. The second-hand Italian-made Carcano rifle had been purchased by Oswald earlier in the year, under the alias A. Heidel. The Carcano was a notoriously inaccurate weapon, and for many, it's hard to believe that with such a weapon, Oswald, despite his former military training, could hit a moving target like the president twice with such precision at a... So, if that gun was truly identified, then that probably added to the whole conspiracy theories that, I mean what it was that type of gun then it, it couldn't have been him but again who, who really knows going back to um john f kennedy's wife how um lyndon b johnson took the oath and she was still in a blood blood splattered clothing when she actually went back to the hospital to get the official confirmation about her husband at, well i think it was when she went back to the hospital but she actually reached into her her pocket for whatever reason and she actually ended up pulling out a piece of her husband's brain. Um, I heard about that back in a, back when I was studying this in grade school. But that I just can't even imagine how, you know, traumatic that would be. Like not only did your husband get shot right beside you, you're covered in his blood, and you pulled out a piece of brain fragmentation that belonged to him. Yeah, that's messed up. Anyway. Range of approximately 250 feet. Shortly afterwards, a Dallas policeman by the name of J.D. Tippett was patrolling his usual area and saw a man who fitted the Oswald description. 
on the corner of 10th Street and Patton Avenue. After a brief exchange of words, Oswald shot Tippett four times with a 38 revolver, killing him in front of witnesses. Oswald ran to the nearby Commercial Street of Jefferson oh, wow. Boulevard. A man named Johnny Calvin Brewer noticed his suspicious behavior and followed Oswald for several blocks to the Texas Theater. Oswald ducked there without buying a ticket. Brewer hailed a police officer, Nick McDonald, who entered the theater accompanied by another officer. Both officers apprehended Oswald on the stage of the Texas Theater, six blocks away from the scene of the crime at 1.50 p.m. When Oswald was arrested, he was carrying a forged identity card bearing the name Alec J. Heidel, the alias he used to buy the rifle. Oh. However, Texas law imposed no control over the purchase of weapons. There was no reason to buy it under an assumed name. So why did Oswald buy the rifle and a handgun by mail order under his assumed name? Curiously, Army Intelligence was known to have a file on A.J. Heidel, the contents of which were destroyed before it could be acquired by investigators. On Sunday morning, November 24th, after being held for two nights, Oswald was being transferred from city jail to the county jail. The event was being broadcast live on TV for millions of Americans to see. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a man shot a pistol point-blank at Oswald, who died two hours later in Parkland Memorial Hospital. The man who fired the pistol was Jack Ruby, a local nightclub owner. Yep. He said that he killed Oswald to spare Mrs. Kennedy the discomfiture of coming back to trial. The state funeral for President Kennedy was held on November 25th, 1963. So, about Jack Ruby, a lot of people believed that um, he was actually hired by a syndicate that was involved in organized crime. The same syndicate that people believed that Lee Harvey Oswald um, may have been a part of. And it was an attempt to cover up their trail. And another interesting thing is that um, all three of them, John F. Kennedy, Lee Harvey Oswald, and Jack Ruby all ended up either dying at or or they were pronounced dead at the exact same hospital <laughs> in Dallas. Yeah, very strange. Anyway, let's continue. With representatives from more than 100 countries and millions of viewers watching it on television. On November 29, 1963, President Lyndon B. Johnson created the President's Commission on the Assassination of President John F. Kennedy, also known as the Warren Commission after its chairman, Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the United States. Its 888-page final report was presented to Johnson on September 24, 1964. The Warren report concluded that Oswald, who had become a skilled marksman as a Marine, had fired three shots, one that entered Kennedy's neck and exited through his throat before hitting Connolly, one that hit Kennedy in the back of the head, the fatal shot, and one that missed the president, but ricocheted off a piece of sidewalk which injured James Taig. Many disagreed with these findings and argued instead that there had been a second shooter on the grassy knoll in Dealey Plaza, that the motorcade had been approaching, and there were witnesses who thought they had heard shots coming from the direction of a railroad beyond the knoll. The report, however, concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby had acted alone, although the findings of the Warren Commission continue to be controversial. Moment of silence. Okay. That was um, really good. That was the assassination of John F. Kennedy, 1963, by Simple History. And um, yeah, it was a very... It was a very informational video. To this day, this assassination is still talked about and it's still shrouded in a lot of controversy and a lot of mystery. Um, I mean, whether they're right or wrong about Lee Harvey Oswald being the one to do it, you know, it's still just unfortunate that we lost a president in this way. And um, as technology improves and uh, surveillance and tactics improve also by you know our law enforcement and our different government agencies you know hopefully tragedies like this can be can be better prevented um and i think i think it already has made a difference so that's it for this episode guys thank you very much for joining me please don't forget to like subscribe and show some love in the comments below do all that good stuff and i will see you all in the next video 
Peace.